So good morning, Tanya. Welcome to my podcast, One for the Road. Um, we good scheduled morning, David. It in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we scheduled it in last week, but you wasn't too well. But you're all back to normal now and you're looking great. So thank you for uh, joining thank me. Thank you. Yeah, I've got four kids and they bring every germ home. I get it all. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you do. Yeah. So as you know, you've listened to my podcast before. We yeah. like to start it from the beginning. Um, and you were born in Wigan, but grew up in North Yorkshire. What was it like for you growing up? Well, um, I actually grew up sort of everywhere because my dad was in the armed forces. So born in Wigan, uh, where my mum's from. My dad's from Liverpool um, in Village Hospital. They've knocked it down now. Um, and I moved to Germany when I was three weeks old. So um, I lived in uh, Duisburg, Munster, uh, Dusseldorf, um, and lived there for the first 11 years of my life and then moved to Abingdon, Oxford. Um, so I had to change schools a lot. And for a shy girl, it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, um, and I think that's where my social anxiety started. Um, but I had a great upbringing, like the best mum and dad I could ever ask for. Um, and I have lots of good memories. Um, and then when I moved to England, it was just a different world because it was with not armed forces children. I'd only been with armed forces children. So, um, yeah, it was just a totally different life. Uh, then I, um, I went through a lot of bad bullying, like really bad, um, for about three years. Um, and then we moved to North Yorkshire and then finished my teenage years there. Wow. Um, so that so, must yeah. have been... Uh... Unsettling for you, keep moving though. You know, like I moved schools as well when I was about 12, and I found that really difficult actually. It was a funny time to move, but did, do you think that um, had an effect on your growing up or did you quite enjoy it? Well, to me, it was it was normal. Um, and when I was little, it, um, I mean, I was always just like painfully, painfully shy. Um, like I wouldn't even speak when I was about eight. My sister had to do the speaking for me and she would always get me friends. My, my little sister, Sherry, uh, she's two years younger than me. Um, she was outgoing and she would, I'd go and get me friends and stuff. Um, so yeah, it was just normal. But looking back, yeah, it was probably, it probably did affect me. Yeah. So what, how did you manage with the bullying then? Because that's, I was bullied as well. And I mean, I was a big lad at school and I got bullied by the smallest kid in the playground. Yeah. And it kind of had an effect on me for a long time after that. Because like, I felt, why, how, why didn't I stand up for myself? But I was like you, I was really shy, timid. I wasn't really streetwise as well at that time. Yeah. Uh, and it had a big effect it, on me. Yeah, it, well, it got, so, it got so bad that I, was, uh, I tried to take my own life. Um, and uh, that's why I really, really hate bullies now. And if I ever see it, then, um, and like you say, like, I just look back and think, why didn't I stand up for myself? But it was all the girls and like they, they was in a gang. Um, and I just moved new to the area and one of their boyfriends fancied me and they were going to give me a Chelsea smile, which is the cut at the side of your mouth and punch you in the stomach. God. So it splits. So, yeah, that was a horrific time. And I've kind of blanked a lot of it out, I think, just trauma-wise. Um, but, yeah, that was horrific. That is horrific. I've heard of it, yeah. but I didn't understand how, how um, that happened. But yeah, when you say you tried to take your own life, how old was you then, then? Um, so the first, um, I think I was, like, 13. I mean, my memory's not great. I've got I'm ADHD and perimenopausal, so... <laughs> I can't even remember my my bank code at the moment. Um, yeah, I was thirteen, um, and um, yeah, it was just horrific. Yeah. Okay, so moving later on into your teens, what happened then? Um, so I moved. Um, I moved uh, to North Yorkshire and found some great friends. And then I sort of turned the other way. There was no way I would get bullied then. No way. Um, um, and that's when we started drinking cider in the Snicket before youth club and things. And I like that. It sort of gave me confidence. Um, and I wasn't shy. Um, and I think that's where 
it started. Yes, yeah, sounds like me. Yeah. Um, it just gives you this false false confidence. Yeah, especially if you've had that kind of upbringing where you're nervous around people and, you, and you know, I can really relate to that. And I, I've quite often spoken about it, that when the lads come around to my house and knocked on my door, I used to say to my dad, or tell him I'm not well or something because I couldn't handle it. Yeah. But then when my mum left and my dad met someone else, I decided I had no other option. And it was then when we went up the shops and they used to give the adults like the loose change had pinched from down the side of the sofa that we would start drinking. And it was like a new world for me, you know, like, like it was that yeah. magic tablet of, oh, my God, I feel really confident and I can make people laugh and I feel happy, you know. Yeah, yeah. And there was no hangovers then either. Not that I remember. No, I do. Oh, <laughs> I probably didn't drink like you. You know, I, I, I remember one time I, I drank a whole bottle of martini. Oh, my God. I didn't even like it. was like shoe polish. Oh. And I just threw up. I, I had a, a record deck with a lid and I ripped the lid off and threw up in the lid. It's oh, like, God. oh, my God. It was just disgusting. Oh, but, awful. Yeah. But you, you, how old were you when you got into the modelling career then? Um, I was um, about 20 um, and see I didn't drink a lot because I didn't have the money to um, and uh, when I was when I was 21 I had my daughter um, and I was a single mom uh, so I didn't have the money to have a problem because I didn't drink a lot but then when I was on the modeling shoots and everything the champagne's flowing and it's all free and um, and I was confident and loved it, but then I'd had to go home to my daughter, mm. and there was no money to be carrying on any anything like that. So I think having no money sort of saved me in those early days. Mm. How did the modelling start then? What was your break there? Um, I won a competition um, in FHM. It was the first um, first non celebrity to be on the cover of FHM and I outsold the JLo cover the most popular one so that was amazing yeah so like a little five foot three girl from living in North Yorkshire um and and it was quite big then because it was before all the reality shows and everything like that so it was like kind of the first reality thing that Mm. that was done and yeah I've had guests on here before that have dealt in the fashion industry and they say drinking's rife because of all the the freebies you get and yeah, it's just everywhere, everywhere. But what saved me was I, I would go in and um, I'd get straight back to my daughter. So I wasn't there constantly. I think if I didn't have my daughter, oh God, I would have been in a mess those days. Yeah, and it was good, actually, that you could turn it off. Yeah. Because you get to a stage where you can't. And, you know, um, many guests on here, they, you know, the off switch, it, it's like you were responsible enough to, to go home and look after your daughter yeah. without opening the bottle of wine. Did that yeah. change over the years? Um, so then I had uh, another baby. Then I met Phil and I had another baby. Um, and my kids always saved me, so because um, I just love being with them. And um, I so I only drank once a week because I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up with them. And it was only probably when I started, when I moved to Cheshire and I started The Housewives and it was filming most days and uh, every scene was sort of champagne and, and stuff like that. And um, I mean, I don't blame The Housewives for it. I don't mean, I don't blame that like, the programme or, or the TV for it. It was actual Housewives that like, would bring champagne and, and even I bought champagne. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, it just got more and more often and, um, uh, and then my, I was on antidepressants, which, um, I thought I had anxiety and depression. Um, and then I found out that it wasn't that <clears throat> it was undiagnosed ADHD. So I think all the drinking and, and then when I, uh, and then to turn myself off from drinking, I would take diazepam at night because I just thought, oh, it's just a sleeping tablet. I now know that they are the worst thing that you can take for your mental health. Um, um, so I was on antidepressants, drinking, diazepam at night, and it was a cycle of that. Um, <clears throat> and then feeling rough, so I thought, oh, I'll have a champagne, perk me up, 
oh, I feel a bit anxious, probably because of all the effects of that. Oh, I'll have a champagne, perk me up. Um, oh, I can't sleep, I'll have a diazepam. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, just years of build of that building up. Um, and then I hit the perimenopause. <clears throat> and, my God, I was... I was a I was a disaster, absolute disaster. Like this time last year, I was in a very very bad way. Probably just drinking, um, not loads every day, but some every day, and then a diazepam at night to go to sleep because my ADHD brain was just wild. Mm. Um, and the only thing that did quiet my mind or make me feel happy or make me feel a little bit confident was uh, drinking or diazepam at night or and the antidepressants. Um, mm. I feel really so, sad for you, Tonya, hearing it because it's a domino effect, isn't it? Yeah. And it's you were trying to manage your life um with the solution at the time. And you know, I've worked in TV as well, and I know you get the highs and the lows of that with the exhaustion yeah. of the hours on end of the filming and, and the adrenaline and whatnot. And then you go yeah. on to a different life, which is your family and feel, and then you're back on set. And it's like yeah. you're in a, uh, on a merry-go-round where you're being spun around continuously, aren't you? And you're just trying yeah. to cope the best way you can. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So then with all that, when I got diagnosed with ADHD, they kept giving me ADHD tablets. But of course, I was on antidepressants, I was drinking, I was having diazepam, and then I was adding in these new drugs, um, which... Oh my God, the worst thing ever. Plus the menopause. Um, uh, yeah, plus the perimenopause, yeah. Um, and of course, when the doctor says, you're not going to drink on these, are you? No, no, you're not taking anything else, are you? No, no, I'm not. Of course I am. So, um, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, looking back, I just think, what are you doing? <laughs> what were you doing, Tanya? But at the time when you're in it, you just... Did you talk you just, to anyone about it or was you holding it all in on your own? Um, yeah, so I've got um, my amazing friend, DJ Fat Tony. He really, really helped me. Um, and I've got a therapist, uh, Diane. <clears throat> um, so I tried um, stopping and that's when I didn't think I had a drink problem. It was only when I tried to stop that I thought, well, why am I drinking again? Why why can't I just stop? Because um, I... And then at that point, I was only drinking at weekends, but I was binge drinking because mm. I thought I deserved it. Uh, and I'm in my 40s. I could do what I want. That was a good old line. Mm. When people, when my husband was saying, look, you can't be doing that. It's like, I'm 40. I'll do what I want. And I can, and now that I'm sober, I can see people doing those lines that I used to do, thinking, oh, no. Mm. No. Well, it's denial, isn't it? It's, it's denial. Like admitting the, that is a problem and I always say if you want to find out if you've got a problem with drinking stop drinking yeah yeah and it's easy to do for 30 days um well easy-ish um but yeah then it's like the the waiting to the, the just go and just get rid of those cravings yeah, well, it's not just that. It's like when you do 30 days, it's always kind of an end to it. And you think, oh, well, it's almost like doing 30-day prison sentence and you know you're coming yeah. out at the end of it. But it's when you decide, actually, I've had enough and I'm going to stop all altogether is when it's a different story, right? Yeah. So, but you, you were on all these medications and... When did you kind of find out about the ADHD? Because I, I, I am aware now, it appears to be a buzzword, right? Oh, I, you know, I've probably got ADHD. You know, I've looked at myself and my overthinking is ridiculous, you know? Yeah. Um, and when did you decide to explore that? Um, well, I, I went to see a specialist about... Um my anxiety um because it just wasn't going away it was a burning rushing feeling and panic attacks and things um and he was watching me for the hour asking me all these questions and then he put his pen and paper down and said i'm i need to do more tests but i'm 99 percent sure you've got adhd not anxiety i was like what i just never in a million years would have thought that so I came home and told my mum and Phil and they were sat on the sofa and I thought my mum was going to go mad because I've not got ADHD. 
And they both looked at each other and she went, well, I've always known there was something. I was like, what? Bloody hell. <laughs> um, and then she said, well, we need to get Rocco uh, on my son checked because he's exactly the same as me, like the emotional dysregulation, like can't find something. Nah, nah, nah. Or hyper-focusing on stuff and then just hyper and wild. and uh, Yeah, so, um, yeah, both of us have got it. So have you, you're on medication now? No, so I had such a bad um, time on the medications. One, uh, it just took away all personality. Um, I was, um, it was like I was mute. I was very happy. I was very calm. But I was like, which I can't do on TV. Another one, I was erratic. I was actually making my fingers bleed just like this. And then the third one, I had a seizure on. Really? Um, I, I do believe, I mean, lots of ladies do um <clears throat> Lots of ladies do have um, great results with some of the medications, but I just didn't. I, I think it's probably been wrongly diagnosed and having all these different antidepressants and the chemicals in my brain were just shocked. Um, and also um, ADHD was mainly a boy thing. And I think it was geared towards them. Like my son thrives on the medication, but women's hormones are up and down and, and just with these chemicals on top, it just didn't, it didn't suit me. Mm. Sounds like a recipe for disaster, doesn't it? ADHD, perimenopausal, diazepam, yeah. alcohol, and yeah. you're only little. Think, think I'm only about, little. Yeah, think yeah. what it was doing to your poor body and your brain. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was actually starting to get a bit of psychosis -y as well when I was drinking, like thinking people were talking about me. And I remember last Christmas and Christmas Day, I was crying on Christmas Day because I drank Christmas Eve and... Um, I forgot to get a couple of presents for the kids and um, <clears throat> I'd wrapped up a couple of presents wrong because I thought I'd have a few drinks um, and then obviously just got them muddled up. Um, and I just felt like the worst person in the world. I was actually thinking, I just need to end it. People would be better off without me, which is the most ridiculous thing. Um, as if my four kids would be better off without me, it would absolutely ruin their lives. Mm. Um, and that's when I said to Phil uh, and DJ Fat Tony said, um, you need to go to rehab. Um, so um, that's when I decided to go to Thailand and I went to a rehab. Um, uh, the cabin in um, Chiang Mai. And it was the best decision I ever made. Well, and when was this, Tonya? I went on January the 4th because that was the first opening that they had. This year. I said to I, uh, yeah, I said to Phil, if I if I if I don't do something now, I'm going to end up in the box. That's how bad I was. Right. Okay. And how was that for you? Um, it was scary, uh, and I felt horrific for like leaving my family for four weeks. But it was better that than me ending up dead. Mm. Um. <clears throat> so yeah, I went and um. The, the psychiatrists there are amazing. Um, uh, and um, a lot of it is, um, God, why can't I think of the word? Heavy menopause. Um, holistic, sorry. Um, so, but they said when, we, when you're in the classes and one-to-one, -one, they said um, a lot of people have addictions um, because of trauma or... Um, trauma, ADHD, oh God, so many people were there with ADHD because it quiets, it quiets the mind and yeah. we're impulsive, yeah. we're very impulsive. So like when I'll say, oh, I'll stop it. And then someone says, do you want a drink? I'll just go, fuck it, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but um, the psychiatrist um, on my notes, it says that mine was down to social anxiety. That's why I drank. Mm. Because I'm so shy and I stopped loving myself. Um, I don't know if I ever did love myself. I was shy and I would bully myself in my own mind. Um, I think carrying on from what the bullies originally did to me, I carried on doing that to myself. And it, and so many people do do it. Like you look in the mirror and just say, oh, you're fat, God. Oh. Um, and that's a voice we hear most most in our life. Mm. And it's really interesting, isn't it? Being that you were a glamour model. And yeah how you felt about yourself yeah yeah 
It's quite well, even that I used to bully myself for going, God, you're embarrassing everyone, you're embarrassing your family. And but that was the only, my only way of making money, like good money for my daughter. Mm. And when you got on Housewives of Cheshire, I mean, although I mean, to be, I will be honest, I don't really watch them, <laughs> but I, I know about them all. And, and the mummy wine culture, like the champagne and whatever, is that absolutely rife in these kind of programs? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is, but uh, just in life in general now. Yeah. Um, ladies who lunch and, um, yeah, and the charity lunches and the charity balls and the um, everything is just, alcohol is just everywhere. I know it is. Um, and, you know, I've been to events, cancer events, where um, charity cancer events where there's free bars and, and it's getting swilled back like the clappers and it's like... Yeah, and everyone's having a fag outside. <laughs> it's ridiculous, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But um, I always remember when I was in another uh, trade, I was in the carpet game, right, and, and at four o'clock the mummies would come back with the kids from the school and you would hear the, well, Prosecco um, courts popping off, right? And... Now, I think, I wonder how many people went home with a problem with booze and, and opened their own bottle up and they didn't talk about it with their friends because of the shame. And that's yeah. what I find a lot of secret drinking now, a lot of conversations where you're all together. And it's not just women, it's men. I think but yeah. men talk about it more. You know, men brag yeah. about it. Yeah, I went home and had a few more beers after the pub and fell asleep on the sofa. Where yeah. women, maybe because of a mum or a professional, whatever, right? It's it's not really spoken about. And did you find yeah. yourself being sort of more secretive about your drinking with your? Yeah, friend? yeah. In the end, because I was struggling mentally, and then like I'd come home from. Uh, work or just uh, at an event or something and my mum would feel like go have you had a drink and I go no no I haven't I haven't and I was lying when I had because when I got there and I was just like oh god I need a drink to even speak to people um, and then come home and lie about it it's just insanity isn't it yeah really really it's just insane. Oh, it's, it's but it's when you have to come out of it to look back into it to see how yeah. ridiculous it was because when I think about the amount of things that I used to do, waste my life, like even like all day lockings in the pub, I will be there at midday and vow to myself, I ain't coming out until the last bell rings. So I'm going to do the shift in the pub. It's like, well, that's a whole Sunday completely <laughs> wasted. And Monday, I, I used to drive to work feeling like absolute hell, looking in my yeah. mirror to see if the police were behind me. Yeah. Creepy but, crawlies in you. Oh, it's horrible, yeah. isn't it? Um, but yeah. the manic depression and the anxiety, mm. and I was on antidepressants, and it was a waste of time because alcohol's a massive depressant anyway. Yeah. And I can really relate to your psychotic thing because I had my dose doubled, and I was seeing things, you know? Like, yeah. I, I was mad um, yeah. when that happened within the first week. Um, yeah. But, but like... You come out of rehab after four weeks. Mm -hmm. How did that feel coming back to reality in the sense, isn't it? It's like, you know, when you're locked inside and you've got all the therapists there and yeah. you've been weaned off, it's quite safe, isn't it? But when you yeah. come back, how well, was you that? Know, you know, when, um, when you pass your driving test um, and then the driving instructor says, yeah. now you, this is when you begin to learn to drive. Now you've mm. passed your test. And I was like, oh, well, it's a bit like that. Um, because you're coming back and everything, there's just alcohol everywhere. And all my friends and the things we used to do all just revolved around alcohol. Um, and even me and my husband used to go out and just have a drink together. And so it was all of that. And then when there was parties and stuff or, or even funerals, um, I felt lonely. I felt really lonely. And the first three months was probably, really, was, well, may, I would say I'd, I, I only got used to it after six months. Mm. That's when it was like, oh, okay. And I think because I'd, I'd managed to get new habits or, or, or um, like go for breakfast instead of lunches, which involved alcohol and stuff mm. like that. And now I've got a new way of life. Um, but yeah, it took to six months for me to feel not lonely and not like a leper. Yeah, 
<laughs> can understand that. But I found the community pretty quickly because I tried AA in the beginning and it didn't really work for me. It just didn't feel right in my gut. Uh, and then I went to an event and met some people. And, that, and that's when I realised, actually, there's so many of us out here trying to do it, you know, and I felt... And they're all cool people. Like, I've been to a few AAs and yeah. uh, and DJ Fat Tony had one, um, uh, an online one, uh, like, after the pandemic. Um, and it, and it's all really cool people. Yeah, I did um, join a couple of Tonys, actually, invited me on one, and it was all right. Yeah, you know, and... yeah I loved it. Yeah, yeah. I, I do daily ones myself now, um, every lunchtime. Oh, do you? I'll have to come yeah, on one. Yeah, yeah, just just people come along and, you know, um, and it's a little group I've created, you know, because people need support and they need community. It's yeah. really important. But when you come out and and you come back to the real world, what about your friends? Did they all support you or were there... Yeah, they were really, really supportive. Um, like, and we've got a group chat of, like, me and my and my close friends. And the, and in the beginning, they were like, oh, God, um, I need I need, I need, need a drink or something. And then they'd be like, oh, God, sorry, Tanya, sorry, Tanya. And I was like, no, I'm fine. Yeah. That's really good, you know. And you didn't have any sort of resistance there of go on, you're all right, you can have one. No, and I think people I think people saw I looked ill. I looked really ill. Um uh and I, I, I they were scared. They were scared, I think. Talk to me about your perimenopausal though, because I had Dr. Rebecca Lewis on here, who's a uh, a menopause specialist, right? And we were talking about it and, uh, you know, how alcohol is the worst thing you could have um, when you're going through the perimenopause. How did it affect you? Um, well, it made it made my ADHD more intense, um, a lot more intense, more impulsive thoughts. Um, um, and, drink, and then I was having intrusive thoughts. Um, like really horrible thoughts um and then the hot sweats and, and even more when I was drinking um and just the brain fog mm. oh just I'm just like a different person anger bouts um everyone got on my nerves um even but when I was drinking, I've always been a nice drunk which was a problem as well because I thought well I, I'm just a nice drunk there's no I'm not a nasty drunk um um, but I was, I was becoming a bit psycho on it. <laughs> Bet Phil was pleased with that, wasn't he? Oh yeah, no, not happy. He <laughs> <laughs> said, "Fuck off, Phil." <laughs> well, the thing is, right? It, um, you were on the cocktail of drugs plus that with the side mm -hmm. effects of perimenopause as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I wonder you felt psychotic. Um, yeah. Because it's a you know a blend. You were like. When you look at the neurotransmitters and how they all work when, when you're drug free, they're all still up and down and, and you know, you have good days, bad days. But when you're mixing diazepam, then waking up in the morning, you've got symptoms of perimenopause, your ADHD yeah. is kicking in, your antidepressants yeah. are sending you all over the place, and then you have a drink. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. No wonder, isn't it? Ticking time bomb. It's Russian roulette, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So what? So you're like ten months sober now. Yeah, nearly eleven. Am I eleven? Oh, it's December, isn't it? <laughs> I've lost yeah, track no. of time. Yeah, I'm eleven. I'm eleven. Eleven. Eleven months sober. Yeah, so you celebrate your your anniversary on the fourth of January. Well, no, because I stopped drinking on the on the thirtieth of December. Yeah. Oh, so that's coming up soon. Yes. So yes. have the kids noticed a difference in you? Oh, my God, they're thriving. They love it. They love it. They didn't like me going out. I hardly go out now. Um, I try and force myself to go to some events, but then I'm straight back, which they love. Um, because it wasn't just me going out for the night. Then I'd be in bed for, like, at least minimum two days. Yeah. Oh, what was, you can't, I can't be doing that with my kids. When you say about going out, I remember I actually that cancer event. I, I met Michelle Heaton there. Um, oh, yeah. She was with a couple of friends there. And because of the bar, she stayed 
um, an hour tops because she really struggled. And I, I gave her a hug and she felt so frail at the time. Do you know what I mean? She, she yeah. was in a, right at the beginning of her sober journey. And I think mm-hmm. because everyone was drinking, it was just too much for her. Yeah, and I think so. The first, uh, the first few months, I would say one to two hours, and everyone would know that, and I just leave. Mm. I like now I can I can dance and stuff, and and I think it was like it was in the summer, um, and I went to a festival, um, and I just wanted to make sure my son was in there and got in the VIP bit and everything, so he was safe. You don't just leave him at a festival, um, and then and then I looked at the clock and I've been there five hours and I was dancing sober, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's just gradual. It's like a muscle. You've got to build it up. You've got to, and your confidence builds. And the more you do it, you go for one hour, and that's building up a little bit of confidence. Yeah. And the next time, two hours, and 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 your social confidence um, as well. And do most people know now you don't drink, and it's not really a, a question for you? Um, well, I put it on my um, Instagram, um, and I did that. Um, because my husband was like, well, why are you putting it on Instagram? Why do you want everyone to know? Um, and I did it. Uh, one of the reasons, many reasons, but one of the reasons was that no one, some, if I went to a bar, someone would say, I thought you weren't drinking. Um, because I just didn't trust myself. I mean, I trust myself now. but Held you accountable, really? Yes. Yeah. And has your sobriety had a knock-on effect with anyone you know? Because quite often you become the mirror of someone and they look at you and this is why you get so much bloody crap when you first stop, right? Because they go, yeah. oh, you ain't got a problem. There's nothing wrong with you because yeah. they're, they're actually saying, I ain't got a problem. Is there anything wrong with me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've, oh, God, I've had so many, so many messages saying that they've stopped because I stopped, and uh, which I love. I'm, and it spurs me on to carry on going as well. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Did did you have any weak moments though, like leading up? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it was probably only a few weeks ago, actually. You know, when you're walking around, um, uh, and it was in um, it was in Selfridges and the Christmas music and everything, and then the champagne stall, and mm. and then I felt, fuck, what? Why? The in- insanity just comes back, so you've always just got to be aware of it. Always. I, I had that. it as well. I said uh, before I was in Lincoln and um, I, it caught me by surprise. It was like an ex jumping out on you and going, da da, here I am. Yeah. And it was yeah. like, oh my God. Um, and it was the same as you. It's the association. It was the particular time of day. It was a Saturday afternoon, all of that stuff. And it kind yeah. of ticked into my brain. And it's like, oh, wouldn't it be nice? And I'm five years now. Do you know what I mean? And it, yeah. And it's like, where's that come from? And it made me a bit edgy. Yeah. Um, I mean, at Easter time, you know, we kept having lo- lots of bank holidays and they were all sunny. And I was like, where were these long bank holiday sunnies when I, when I drank? And, and people keep offering me babysitters. And I was like, oh, my God, if I was drinking now... There was never um, a bank holiday and there was never a sunny bank holiday and there was never a babysitter, all three. And now I've got all three. And that used to, oh, that used to send me crazy, but I got through it. Yeah. Now, an awkward question now is, does Phil prefer this version of you? <laughs> the non drink um, version? I'm not sure because he drinks and uh, I think he finds me a little bit judgy now I'm not judgy um but I just don't want him to drink because I want him to sit with me <laughs> so like gone are our days where because me and him just used to love to go on a little bender together um but we, yeah uh, that's taken a lot of time to work through uh, when one one drinks and one doesn't yeah that's taken a lot of time but we seem to have got there now it's really difficult because Quite a lot of people, they come to me for help with that conversation. Is mm. and I always say to them, like, it's it's good at the beginning to ask how they feel. Keep checking yeah. in because we go on our little journey, don't we? Or big journey, yeah. Right? And then we're getting healthy, we're getting fit, we start to look better, and we start to sleep better, and. And then we yeah. start to say, oh, yeah, I, saw, I listened to this great podcast or I saw this documentary 
um, and I've read this book and, oh, do you have to have another one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that comes in and then you're like, we go off on this road and now, well, actually, I've lost my drinking partner. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. really hard, isn't it? It's really hard. And I think he did find it really hard for the first six months. But now I can sit at a beach club while he has a drink and I, I, it doesn't bother me. And I don't get all judgy. Um, mm. um, but yeah, it, took, it, took, it takes time. Have you had a holiday okay. yet? Yes, I've had, uh, I think I've had like three holidays now. Have you? And, and be- best holidays ever. Yeah. Best holidays ever. Like normally I say, oh, Phil, you take the kids to the water park because I'm either hungover or I'd rather just sit with a strawberry daiquiri at the beach. And I've been whizzing down slides and getting the dopamine hit, adrenaline run, which I've never would have done that before. Yeah. Yeah. It changes, doesn't it, what you look for in life. I mean, I've had a few yeah. days before and I had one little twinge once, but I've got over that. And it's you actually get on the plane at the end of the holiday and you feel like you've yeah. had a holiday. Yes. And uh, we went to uh, we went for a couple of days um, to Ibiza, me and Phil, uh, to watch DJ Fat Tony. And because uh, I've got sober friends now, like they weren't drinking or anything. Um, and that was the first time I've been to Ibiza where I haven't wanted the plane just to fucking crash at the end. I was in such a bad state. Yeah. I was like, oh, God. Um, yeah. And I loved it. So health wise now, you're feeling a lot better. Um, what about all the other stuff, like you're not on ADHD meds, diazepam? No, no, no. So when I went oh, to rehab, they, they said, because I didn't think they were bad, um, and they, they look in your suitcase to make sure you've got no meds or, or, or anything with you or alcohol, um, and they was like, what, these are benzos, and I was like, no, they're diazepam. And they were going, these are so bad for you. And I was like, what? Just to help me sleep. And I took some to rehab with me, thinking I could have them there. Yeah. Yeah, I just didn't know. That's so addictive. Yeah. That, you know, you mix them two, it's such a lethal cocktail. Um, yeah. So you're off the them, you're off the booze. Yeah. You're and smoking, able- stop smoking. Wow. Yeah. Off the fags. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a new life. Yeah, it's amazing. My skin's just trying to, I used to spend like thousands on trying to, on all these face creams and everything. And all I needed to do was stop smoking and drinking. Mm. So now, how do you feel about yourself? Um, I I feel like I'm the best mum in the world now. And that means that, that means the most to me. Um, and I couldn't have said that this time last year. Yeah. But how do you feel about yourself? I love myself. Yeah? Yeah. See what I mean? This is yeah. the big thing, right? Because all the time we're on this hamster wheel of self-destruction, it's self-harming all the time, isn't it? It's constant yeah. self-harming. And that yeah. can tap into the trauma from growing up or a poor relationship when you're younger, yeah. not feeling loved as a child, whatever it is, right? Big T's, little T's, I call them. And mm. you carry that through life. And we self-destruct ourselves, don't we? by drugs and and we're depressed and anxious and yeah we try and find quick solutions all the time to to get better right but it's making us worse but yeah. when you remove them that's what makes you better and you yeah. can look in the mirror in the morning and go do you know what i'm all right i am yeah yeah i remember i used to be like go to the gym every week like i'm thinking um uh, being healthy, not not drank all week, and like, right, I'm going to press the big bucket button now. I deserve it. Like, what is that thinking? It's insanity. It's because you you can't really see outside the box, can you? You know, like, the, yeah. I think it's that work hard, play hard thing, isn't it? Like, yeah. you might have had a really good week on that show, um, and you think, do you know what? I'm at home now. I deserve a treat and. And it isn't, is it? It's a temporary yeah. solution to a problem. Yeah, yeah. And then mixed with the symptoms of the perimenopause, and it's just a disaster, isn't it? And then we yeah. love ourselves because we know we've got a problem, really, and this is why the denial comes in, isn't it? And Yeah. Well, alcohol is a poison, so it's a problem for everyone who drinks it because it's a poison. Yeah. Um, 
and it's just everywhere. But I do, I do think there is a sober re like revolution on its way. I really do. And do you think like your besties and that that they're gonna fall suit with you like one day? Yeah, they, I don't think they drink half as much as they used to. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I think we've got to keep banging the drum, getting messages out there, um, yeah. and letting people know you you can live a life without it, and it's not boring. You know, I did a post, and it was about that. Quite often, it's the opposite of what we think when we're drinking. So my, my yeah, well, if if it was boring, I said I would have started back drinking again. Yeah. So. So there's people listening to this now. Um, what would you suggest to them? to start I would um I would um go well go and see go and see the doctor because I don't know do they do rehabs well they, basically do they don't no honestly from my experience you can't even get a doctor's appointment now yeah yeah you can't right? true and True. then if you can, you go and they tell you to go to AA and that and that's as far as I've that's what people yeah. have told me because I'm not in that space now, but I just can't get doctor's appointment for love or money. And yeah. I think they're so overstretched that the only resource they offer you is either re rehab or AA. And yeah. they're all like private rehab and most people haven't got the money for them. Right? Yeah. I do love, I do love AA though. And they say to do AA uh, 90, 90 meetings in 90 days. Don't they? I do. I do love AA. Uh, and just keep just keep going till you find one that you like. I think you need to find out what works for you, right? Yeah, but find but also find um, like podcasts like yourself. I, I just immerse yourself, um, yeah. podcasts, quick lit books, and just find what works for you. I think so, and connect with a community. I mean, the sober mm. community on socials is really good, um, and you know you can mix and match as well. You know, yeah. AA didn't work for me, but yeah. I've got a friend who goes to AA, and I did say to him, like, I'll come along with you one night um, and sit with you in the meeting, you know. Yeah. But at the time, it didn't work. But that's fine. I've often said, it's like we go shopping, say, up the King's Road, right, and you say, let's go in this shop. And I'm going, nah, it's not really my thing. And then I'll yeah. take you in a shop, and you go, that's not mine. That's how it is, right? You have to find out yeah. what works for you. Yeah. Like I used to do the the AA, but um, now that I'm okay, I can't sit. I've got ADHD, so I can't sit for an hour. I get all fidgety, and I need to be off doing stuff. So yeah, um, I just. Uh, but the twelve steps, I think, to go until you know the twelve steps is is crucial. It's because I do. I pray. I pray every every day now. Yeah. Yeah, I think that some of the steps are are really important for life. Anyway. Yeah, um, definitely. But. Yeah. yeah, there's mixed sort of um, ideas about that, but it works for you, and that's yeah. great. And do you still go to meetings now, then? No, I don't really go to meetings um, because, like I say, I have i don't feel like I'm in that space, um, and I do get a bit fidgety, and I've got stuff to do. And Yeah. Um, but if if I if I was feeling like I was on a downward slide or I would slide, I would get myself in there. Yeah. How do you deal with that then? If you're not you're not on medication for ADHD, like is have you found ways of managing it on your own now? Um, yeah, I just um, <clears throat> so I meditate every morning. I have to exercise. I have to watch. Uh, I have to drink my water. I have fish oils, evening primrose oil, uh, lion's mane mushrooms. Um, and and I just embrace it, and it's awareness. Like I think, if if I'm on a spin, I just go, oh, just breathe, fucking ADHD brain. And just the awareness of it, um, or like I'll catch myself this morning. I was going, we've not got these prints ready, we've not got this ready, and then I go, right, just calm it. You've been erratic. Just mm. just chill out. Maybe you so, identify it more now you're sober, because you're yeah. not living in. I always say chaos creates chaos, and your yeah. life sounded chaotic to me yeah with yeah. everything and when you come out of it you can process it and analyze it and go no stop it's my adhd brain let's work it out let's breathe yeah. five minutes yeah yeah but before well, that's when a, a lot of people was yeah a lot of people would say well, what's the point getting diagnosed if i'm not going to take medication and and i do say well 
it, it is the awareness of it and having the tools and mm. um yeah awareness is key for me mm. there's a great podcast called uh adhd chatter with alex partridge um and uh he's he was the founder of lad's bible oh uh, yes i spoke to him yeah 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 he's great isn't he yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah, he took me out in his Range Rover for a drive. Oh my god, <laughs> it is like being at Fort Park with him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I met him for dinner. He's a he's a top bloke, you know. Yeah, uh, and it's you know like more and more people are comparing how they are um, with because for me it was the turning the volume off because I was such an overthinker. I was really fussy overanalyze yeah. everything and like so many things fidgety um yeah. and i haven't gone for diagnosis because it's almost like do i really need to be diagnosed when i know where i am with my overthinking is i have to divert my brain sometimes and just slow down think yeah. all right take a breath do some even if it's watching half an hour of something just to take my mind it's it gathers momentum yeah. do you know what i mean yeah well you're already doing around. the steps anyway so yeah yeah um but a lot of, a lot of um a lot of people growing up when, when they're still drinking and and the impulsiveness and that's why i had to medicate my son because he won't listen to any steps he won't meditate um and then uh, if he if he gets in a fight or something and he's just impulsive to hit someone or something and you just don't know so um yeah it's well it's scary so what does the future look like tanya what what you got coming up um so god what am i what have i got coming up um so i I still go back on housewives as a guest and just full-time mommy and just doing bits and bobs that make me happy yeah because my my kids schedules are just um even more intense now like two uh two of my boys are signed to football clubs they're really good. So they have they train four times a week each and in different like areas and then my little one as well. And um so yeah. It's life is busy. I was yeah. a football manager for ten years, so I know what oh, that's is you? Like. yeah, it's just crazy. And a friend of mine's son is uh, in the England camp, you know, as a oh, goalkeeper right, yeah. and it's just yeah. you virtually give your whole life up for it, don't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's full time. And yeah. when you go back on the housewives as a guest, does it feel different now? You don't drink. Uh, yeah, it does. At first, I felt a bit left out, um, but then when you stop drinking, it, it you realise fucking how no one really, a lot of people weren't drinking, and I just thought they were. Yeah, it's bad, isn't it? I, I was the yeah. same. I realised yeah. I was the enabler as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was about pouring yeah. drinks to justify my own drinking. Yeah, yeah. And it's always the ones who go, come on, don't be boring, have one. They're the ones with the problem. Yeah. Because I was well, one of those. I think it's fantastic. Uh, congratulations to you as well. Um, Thank you. What What are you going to be doing for your one-year anniversary? Um, well, my my husband's uh, an assistant manager for Macclesfield Town now, so we'll probably just be sat in watching a film because uh, we can't go on holiday. <laughs> I was hoping to be in Dubai, but no, we'll be in we'll be at home. Oh, well, I might get a cake. Have a big cake. Go yeah, for it. I'll Eat it all cake. on your own. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, the kids are not having any. No, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> all right tanya well thank you so much for joining me today and and again oh, thank you you look after yourself oh you too thank you david bye. all right bye bye, bye. bye. bye.